fans of AMD graphics cards have coined the term fine wine technology to describe the way they seem to get better with age, and this arguably started with their graphics core Next architecture. The first generation of GCN cards remained remarkably relevant for a long time. Now though, after more than 10 years, it looks as though GPUs like the HD7970 have finally succumbed to the ravages of time. Perhaps though, we still have some time for one last sampling before fine wine turns to vinegar. Released at the end of 2011, the HD7970 was AMD's top-end single GPU card until the launch of GCN2 in 2013. When 4K first emerged as a standard for home displays, this was the kind of GPU gamers had to work with, though admittedly you'd probably have had more luck with a pair of such cards linked in Crossfire. Nowadays Crossfire is dead, and so is any hope of running modern games at Ultra HD on this ageing beast. First gen GCN cards don't support DX12 exclusive titles, which meant I was unable to test Halo Infinite or Elden Ring. 3GB cards are now below the minimum requirement for some games, which is reflected in the visual quality of some titles, and also goes to explain why I couldn't test Guardians of the Galaxy, which requires 4 gigs to even start. To rub a little salt into that open wound, AMD saw fit to discontinue driver support last year, so I'm using the modded 22.5.1 driver set from Amername Zone, a link to which is in the description. My test unit is a Gigabyte HD7970 tested on my usual moderately priced gaming PC with a Ryzen 5 5600G and 16 gigs of DDR4 3600. I would normally run my tests a second time on a quad-core configuration of the same PC, but this video was actually intended to be about the R7-260X. That card proved to be faulty, which cost me a day of benchmarking and meant I ran out of time. Rest assured though, nothing is being CPU limited here. Aside from some minor differences in frame times, owners of lower spec CPUs should see mostly similar results. Kicking off with God of War, and at 1080 original settings, it can provide a better than PS4 level of performance, staying above 30 FPS in combat and only dipping slightly during cutscenes. That latter flaw can be corrected without much fuss, simply by enabling FSR2. This new temporal version of AMD's upscaler doesn't quite give the performance boost the previous version did, but the maximum quality setting is all that's needed to avoid frame drops in cutscenes and more demanding sections, and with barely any noticeable effect on image quality. The PC port of Final Fantasy VII Remake runs with non-optional dynamic resolution scaling and an FPS limiter with a mind of its own. Nevertheless, the HD7970 can deliver a decent enough experience, though I found dropping shadows to low was necessary to keep things running without hitches. With the FPS limiter at its maximum value of 120, the 7970 can manage a 53 FPS average with 1% a hair below 40. Leaving shadows at high drops both figures by a couple of frames in gameplay, but during certain cutscenes things get pretty stuttery. Also, for what it's worth, dropping the frame limiter to 30 doesn't do a huge amount for performance, but it does reduce the GPU's reliance on dynamic scaling, and as such, in my opinion, the image appears a good deal sharper in some scenes. I've been disappointed by Forza Horizon 5 on GCN cards before, and the 7970 sadly keeps that trend going. From a visual standpoint, the alpha channel glitch I've noticed on the first three generations of GCN cards is still present and correct, even with the latest Nimes drivers. From a performance standpoint, 1080 medium might be acceptable for driving down the freeway, but in races and urban areas it will dip below 30 FPS on occasion. The built-in benchmark, which is set in an urban area and features a ton of other cars, averages just below 30 FPS. Adding quality upscaling doesn't do a whole lot for the frame rates either, pushing the average up by only a couple of frames. Cyberpunk at 1080 low doesn't look like the graphical powerhouse I've come to expect. While I'll admit it doesn't have the awful LOD issues seen on lower end cards and on the PS4 itself, it also looks pretty flat and uninteresting. 
The performance doesn't help shake that last gen feel either, running at barely above 30 FPS on average. Adding FSR helps the latter, if not the former. The quality setting brings almost an extra 9 FPS to the average, but has a noticeable impact on detail. My own preference would be to keep FSR on quality and turn the preset up from low to medium. The image is still fairly soft, this is only FSR 1 after all, but the overall presentation is more in line with what I've come to expect from the game. More importantly, it can do this while still running over 30 FPS most of the time. At 1080 high settings, Rainbow Six Extraction only runs through its canned benchmark at 45 FPS, about 10% faster than the R9 280, which is based on the same GPU as the cut down HD 7950. Still, for a first person shooter, this isn't ideal, so you might want to either drop quality settings or use some resolution scaling. The built in scaler here is actually pretty decent quality. 50% scaling doesn't look too bad at least in part because it's not 50% of each side, but 50% of the total area, so more like 70% in other games. And this allows for an average of over 60 FPS. Competitive shooter Splitgate is kind of a throwback to arena shooters of the 2000s, but it still needs some decent GPU horsepower to push a high framerate experience. The 7970 can oblige, churning out over 110 FPS on average at 1080 Epic and over 90 FPS at the low end. If you'd prefer higher minimums, there's still plenty of room to drop quality settings. Call of Duty Vanguard performs surprisingly well on the 7970, but not without making some major sacrifices. The average FPS over 3 matches at 1080 low came to 54, but in several matches I noticed the game was constantly struggling with the 3 gig frame buffer, switching back and forth between high and low quality assets, particularly seen in textures. If you're just looking for a good competitive FPS experience you probably won't mind too much about this, but I admit I found it pretty distracting. Also, FSR didn't really help at all, adding virtually nothing to the average of native 1080, though different maps may give different results. The 7970 didn't impress in Fortnite, but I suspect this isn't entirely the card's fault. At competitive settings and 1080 resolution, the card only managed just over 80 FPS on average. This is about 5% lower than the inferior R9 280 did when I tested it a few months ago. This isn't mirrored in the high settings test, where the 7970 is, in turn, about 5% faster than the lower end card. Either way, the 1% lows are still appalling at any setting, and as usual, the reason for this seems to fall at Epic's feet, and not your graphics cards. I was also a little disappointed in how the 7970 handled Warzone. It's 45 FPS average at 1080 low and almost 60 FPS using 67% scaling are just about playable, sure, but that's not why I'm disappointed. Once more, the scores from the 7970 are basically indistinguishable from those of the R9 280, a card with 256 fewer shader units and almost 170 MHz slower clock speeds. Finally, this one's backed by popular demand. I asked my community what games they'd like to see me drop and what they'd replace them with. Several people suggested I drop Battlefield 2042, and admittedly that happened to coincide with my own feelings about the game, so for the rest of 2022 I'll be replacing that game with Apex Legends. It's not a new title and that was kind of the purpose of this series, but it is one of the most popular games on Steam and it didn't cost me anything. 1080 low settings seems to be the best fit for the 7970, averaging a little under 90 FPS and only occasionally dipping below 60. With an ever increasing number of titles demanding DX12 feature support and 4 gigs or more VRAM, it seems like this might be close to the end of the road for the HD 7970. Given its outrageous power draw, anyone looking to buy one of these in 2022 should be looking to pay as little as possible. 
Mine cost me £50, but honestly, in the current market, that seems a little steep. If you're happy playing GTA 5 and other older titles, this could tide you by for a while, and at £35, maybe $40 to $45, I'd say it could be a reasonable buy. But then, a little more money could afford a 4GB RX 460 or GTX 960, both cards that will cost less to run and which have a better future ahead of them. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.